Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Well, we've got a new worship couple. Yeah. Wow, that was wonderful. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, uh, many of you think, well, I could never do that. I'm, I'm too scared. I'm just that, the other. But you know, the, the, willing, the willing heart and the willing soul, yes. God will take care of the rest. Yes. Guarantee it. Because uh, I'm, I'm not no orator or anything else, but I'm willing. So I ask the Father to put his words in my mouth. So <clears throat> we're going to uh, look at our Torah portion for today. Naso means to take. Numbers 4, 21 through 7, 8. It is the longest parashah in the Torah. It's got 176 verses. So I'm probably going to eat about two hours. <laughs> You're good with it, huh? We'll take a break and we'll have an inter intermission, huh? Okay. I hope you drank some coffee this morning. Maybe you'll be awake, right? So, <clears throat> there's a lot of things in included in this Torah portion. And uh, <clears throat> we're, of course, not going to be able to cover all of it. But uh, some of the higher lights that, I that spoke to me, we'll talk about those. But... What we find in here is the taking of the senses, putting out of the camp the defiled, restitution for wrongs, consecration of the tabernacle, offerings of dedication of the tabernacle, test for unfaithful wife, the Nazarite vow, and the ironic blessings. Wow. Yeah. So that covers a multitude of a lot of different things, and so we'll have a lot to talk about this afternoon in our round table. And uh, <clears throat> please come and join us if you can, and uh, put your thoughts in. So we're going to start with the purifying of the camp. The last two or three Torah portions has about, been about this very same thing. And uh, I don't know if, if about y'all, but it spoke to me. It's spoken to me for several weeks about the purification of our own selves uh, particularly we as priests of our household. And I don't know if you fully grasp that idea. It seems to be a foreign concept, but it also is a biblical concept. <clears throat> it's what it was in the very beginning, and it was uh, what the, the Messiah came to restore, one of the re restorations of those things. You know, we was reading the other... Uh, I think Wednesday evening, about in Acts where it says that <clears throat> the Yeshua was taken back into the heavens until the times of restitution of all things that had been spoken of by the prophets from the foundation of the world. Wow. Did you really, did you really hear that? Did you really understand that? To restore everything spoken of by the prophets from the foundation of the world. And yet we live in a society that wants to say, no, we changed that, we changed it. That old stuff back there is no good. But as we delve more into these Torah portions, really try to apply it to your life and not just read about a history of a people that uh, failed God. Okay? All right, Numbers 5, starting in verse 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, every one that hath an issue, and whosoever is defiled by the dead. Both male and female shall you put out. Without the camp shall you put them, that they defile not their camps in the midst whereof I dwell. How does this apply to us? Or does it apply to you? After all, we don't have any lepers, or do we? Remember when we did the Torah portion about the lepers, how that it was, could be pride. It could be a lot of other things. Lashon Ra, these different types of things could cause leprosy to come upon us. 
not necessarily in the physical, but in the spiritual. Amen. So <clears throat> examine ourselves daily. Because as we read in the New Testament, <clears throat> know you not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of Jehovah dwells in you. So that means that there's no other room in there dwelling within you for any other spirits, right? You know, we talked about uh, the spirits of drugs and alcohol and those types of things last Shabbat. Those are definitely spirits. If we have them living within, then there's no room for the Holy Spirit to, re to dwell within. Do you remember the, the story of the one that was cleansed of all of those, and yet he didn't fill it, and what happened? They all came back seven times and filled that, that void. Yep. So we want to make sure that we keep our space full, or that there's no room in the inn right. for these spirits. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall Jehovah destroy, for the temple of Jehovah is holy, which temple you are. So really, really put that on a physical plane, then we got a lot of work to do within our own selves, within our own bodies. Yep. It says, know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? Jehovah forbid, in what agreement hath the temple of Jehovah with idols? For ye are the temple of the living Elohim. As Jehovah has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be you separate, saith Yahweh, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says Jehovah Almighty. Amen. And we read in Revelations, Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my Elohim, and the name of the city of my Elohim, New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from Jehovah. And I will write upon him my new name. Well, it kind of brings us back to one of the things that we said. It says that we are to place them on our forehead, in our hands, on our gates. His words, his commandments. And he said, if you do those things, I will write upon you a new name. Going on to 1 Peter 2, 5. It says, You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh by Yeshua the Messiah. Wow. Spiritual sacrifices. Mm. So it does matter what comes out of our mouth, right? does matter how that we treat our fellow man, how we treat our neighbors. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If there be therefore any consolation in the Messiah, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through the strife or vain boasting, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than himself. Why there was comparing pride and these types of things to leprosy. Let this mind be in you, which was also in the Messiah, Yeshua. 
You know, if we could just follow that bracelet, what would Yeshua do? What would Yeshua do? Luke twenty two twenty four, And there was also a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? This was within his own disciples. Unfortunately, it's kind of part of our nature, isn't it? Something that we have to wrestle with daily. But you shall not be <clears throat> but ye shall not be so, but that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. Is not he that sets at the table, but I am among you as he that serves, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed to me. These were some of the very words that were spoken at the Last Supper by Yeshua himself. He says, I took the vapor and girded myself and I served you as a servant. They had a hard time with that at first. He was showing them that we're all to be servants of mankind. We're called to be servants for our brethren. It says that you may eat and drink in my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Isn't that what he said that night? He says, I am pointing to you a kingdom. In times of this ignorance, this is Acts 17, Elohim with, winked at, but new commands all men, now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. He hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Of course, that was the very message of the Elijah of Yeshua's time. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So that's something that should echo all down through the ages. And truly, if we are in the times of Elijah, that was his message, right? Yes. Repent. He was calling on the whole nation to repent. The whole nation had gone whoring after other gods. Mm -hmm. The king himself had married a non-virtuous woman that steered the whole nation towards idol worship even appointing their own priesthood, 400 priests of Baal. Yet he called Elijah to, to go against that and call the nation to repentance. How about today? Are we sounding Elijah's message? Are we saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand? Moving to the restitution of wrongs. Sometimes we read this in the scriptures and we don't really understand it or we say, well, you know, I, I told them I was sorry. Or, well, they're the ones that offended me, so I don't need to do anything. Numbers 5, 6 says, Speaking to the children of Israel, when a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit, commit to do a trespass against Yahweh and that person be guilty, then they shall confess their sin which they have done and he shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof and add unto it the fifth part thereof and give it unto him against whom he hath trespassed. Even if you have sinned against Yahweh. We don't always look at that we need to bring a restitution to that. We just ask, well, sorry, God, forgive me. Because every 
sin has to be a recompense made. But if a man have no kinsman to recompense the trespass unto, in other words, another person that you've trespassed and there's nobody left, let the trespass be recompensed unto Yahweh, even to the priest besides the ram of the atonement, whereby an atonement shall be made for him. So in reality, part of the recompense was they took a a ram or a lamb or whatever it might be, brought it out of their own flock as an atonement to be made. And every offering of all the holy things of the children of Israel which they bring unto the priest shall be his. And every man's hallowed thing shall be his. Whatsoever any man giveth the priest it shall be his. Since there were to be free will offerings, they didn't automatically belong to the priest. Okay. It's only if you gave the free will offering to the priest. We think of these sins as stealing something material from someone. How about stealing someone's good name? Repentance comes first then restitution, then forgiveness. Sometimes we forget the restitution. Matthew 3, 8 says, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Bring therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Repentance, restitution, forgiveness. I'm going to hit how about a few of these things, and then we're going to get in a little bit deeper on this next subject. Numbers 5.12. This is the wayward wife. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go astray, aside, and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her car- carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled, then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephod of barley meal, he shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before Yahweh. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it into the water. Then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, Yahweh make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when Yahweh doeth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with a bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causes the curse, and the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. So this is trial by bitter water to see if if she is in the wrong. If she's not, nothing happens as you read the whole story. But what does this have to do with us? How can we apply this? Read a couple of scriptures, and we're going to look in a little bit more depth into this. This is in Jeremiah 3, 6. Yahweh said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up on every high mountain and upon every green tree, and there have played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. This is speaking to the ten tribes of Israel, right? And I saw when for all of the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, 
had I put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredoms that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Defile the land. Maybe we'd never really think about that. How about right here in America? Is our land defiled? Yep. Yes, it is. Not necessarily just by altars and these types of things, but what are the people celebrating and doing? Right. Committing adultery with other gods. Yeah. But, oh, brother, no, no, I, I, I don't alter. I don't worship other gods. I worship Jesus. Yet these things become embedded into our belief system, just like Israel of old. And yet for all of this, her treacherous sister Judah had not turned unto me with her whole heart, but fendedly, saith Yahweh. In other words, we want to still be married to you, but we kind of want to do our own thing. Uh, you know? And you always said unto me, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than the treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith Yahweh, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith Yahweh. And I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquities, that thou hast transgressed against Yahweh thy Elohim, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says Yahweh. So, <clears throat> this is the Torah portion about the jealous husband over the wife applies can be applied and is being applied throughout scripture to Israel as a whole yeah. to his people and not just those Israel of old but all people on this face of this earth so it goes on and Jeremiah says surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband so have you dealt treacherously with me O house of Israel says Yahweh a voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their ways, and they have forgotten Yahweh, their Elohim. Return you backsliding children, and I will <coughs> heal your backsliding. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art Yahweh, our Elohim. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains, but truly in Yahweh or Elohim is the salvation of Israel. What is he telling us here? Why is he work using these words, hill and mountains? What do they represent? Multitudes of mountains. We see multitudes of mountains in our land, in our, not the physical mountains. What did Yahshua say to the woman at the well? And what did, he, what did she say to him? She said, well, our people worship in this mountain, and y'all worship in that mountain. What is the truth? So mountain represents God's assembly or an assembly, right? So if we put that into our understanding here, then he says, if salvation is hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of churches out here, that are teaching all these kinds of doctrine and we're going there because that's where salvation is he's going no you went to the wrong mountain you need to go to my mountain since almost every physical thing in the scripture has a spiritual application if you've ever thought of it that way so it becomes more of a teaching if we look at these things. More of something that we can take a hold of 
we see the physical thing and see what he's really talking about is becomes more alive to us that it's something that is a and that's why he talked in parables right and his disciples asked him so what are you talking parables for what's the deal he says those that have eyes to see and those that have ears to hear will understand so we need to tune our ears to hear that voice of god tune our eyes put on that magnifying glasses that we can really see what he's trying to show us here we see where two other times israel symbolized by a woman is made to drink of this bitter water not only israel but in the end all mankind Exodus 32, 19, And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger grew hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand, tablets out of his hands, and break them beneath the mount. Right there tells us something, the mount. Come up to my mountain, and I will give you my laws. Come up to my mountain, and I will show you what salvation is about. And he took the calf which they had made and he burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strewn it on the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men tried with the bitter water. There must have been some outward show of what would happen for them to know what men that they were to kill. It says, make them drink of this. This golden calf was made out of gold. And I imagine if you drank enough of it, it would probably do some physical damage to you. Moving on to Revelation 8.1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before Elohim, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. This is the heavenly sanctuary that's in existence today. This altar is there. That's where your, uh, your prayers ascend to before the Father. And that was right in front of the most holy apartment that contained the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat where the Spirit of Jehovah sat even today. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before Elohim out of the angel's hand. Just think the sin, the prayers that was prayed here. Could we really see those ascending up? Ascending like smoke of the incense with a sweet aroma. It says, an angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of that star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Once again, the Father is calling back to his mountain where you don't have to drink of this wormwood. Drink of this bitter water. You know, in a, even in a sense, when you begin to see the things <clears throat> that you were taught before sometimes that makes you kind of bitter 
you know, why, why did, were that taught? That's not true. We're going to move to Revelation 14, 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Elohim and the faith of Yeshua. So he's painting a picture here. The difference between those that receive the mark of the beast and those that receive the mark of God. And we can go into a lot of things about the mark of beast, but what we find if if you if Satan has a mark that he's going to place upon you, saying that he's his, then it would necessarily, I think, mean that God has a mark that he's placing upon us to say, no, he's my guy. So what do we find in, in the scriptures? The very thing that he says that the Shabbat will be a sign between you and me. It says in the things that we repeat here every Shabbat to place his commandments in our forehead and on our hands and in our hearts. That is the, the sign because if you look it up in the Hebrew, it's the same word, ot, which is a sign or a mark. So when he's talking about the mark of the beast, it's a sign also of the beast. I'm going to look at some, some things, hopefully, that will help us understand more of what these Torah portions are, are trying to tell us. I'm going to look at the two women that the scripture talks about. This is Revelation 12, 1. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon, under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. If you saw that, even in a dream, you would, you would scratch your head and say, Wow, who, what is this? Who is this? What does this mean? Clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, for her head a crown of 12 stars. What do we, how do we see that the woman that becomes the bride is being represented here? She's clothed with the sun and the moon. What does that mean? God's woman or God's People follow the counter that God set in the heavens. The sun and the moon regulate God's counter. The counter that is on your wall is only regulated by the sun. The calendar <clears throat> that Mohammedism is only set by the moon. But God says, I'm going to give you a counter of the sun and the moon. My bride will be clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and the 12 stars as crown on her head. Of course, that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 disciples, 12 apostles. And she being with ch child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. 
And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Well, I think we have an inkling of an idea who this represents. On it not only represents Hasatan, but it also represents what about these seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. These represent kingdoms on the earth. The dragon is ahead of them. He says with his tail that he drew a third part of the stars of the angels of heaven. Going on, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto Elohim and to his throne. This child was to rule all nations. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of Elohim that they should feed her there a 1,260 days. 1,260 days. We're going to look at this number. We'll see it in a couple of different places in Scripture. And maybe we can place where this might occur. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. They were cast out at the death of Messiah. We can even read it in the New Testament where it says that he was no more allowed into heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Because we see that uh, prior to this event in Job, we see that he could come and go into heaven. Read it in Job, where it says that the council met, and he appeared among them. And yes, the father asked him, where did you come from? Ah, oh, from earth, walking to and fro through the earth. Because he gained control of the earth, the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. <clears throat> and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our Elohim and the power of his Messiah for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our Elohim day and night. And they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and ye that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having a great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that, eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished for a times and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. 1,260 years or days. And how we can come to this is that time represents a year, okay? In prophetic time, a year is represented as 360 days. So you've got 360, and then it says times, two more years. Add those two 360s together, and a half of a year, 180, and you get what 1,260 years or days. And we know it's years because what the Bible says, a day for a year, Right? In different places. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. 
What was this flood? Was it a water? What was this flood that this cast out of his mouth? The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. So what happens shortly after the death of the Messiah? Well, of course, we see 70 A.D. was destruction of the temple, scattering of Judah. We see into the first and second century that they'd already had men had come in and taken a hold of the true woman assembly, began to go after man's laws, setting up man's law, culminating in 324 or 325 with Constantine changing God's law. But even prior to that, that some had already began to worship on the first day of the week. This is that flood that the serpent was trying to drown the woman with. He said, I can't kill, I can't kill him, but maybe I can flood these, these people with so much misinformation, mis un unbiblical doctrine that it doesn't matter if they live on or not because they're going to be over here and not one of part of God's woman. So it be began a, a, a fight between right and wrong. And we saw that through history how certain men rose up and took a hold of this false doctrine and perpetuated it and added to to the extent that it they became Christ on earth, said that they were Christ on earth. They had the authority to change God's laws. Come to us. Don't come to him. Come to us. We'll give you salvation. Salvation from many mountains. Since the dragon was wrought with a woman and went to make war with remnants of her seed, which keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yeshua. So why was he wrought? They didn't want to follow him. They were following God and his commandments. Trying to destroy. And here we see a picture of this very biblical thing that we just read. The church and the dragon are God's woman and the woman of dragon, of Satan. Interesting, you can really look at this maybe later. It has a lot of interesting information in it. But it shows that God's woman is standing here clothed with the sun and the moon at her feet. The red dragon is there with these <clears throat> seven heads and ten crowns and so forth. He drew, drawing the star, the uh, angels with his, with his uh, tail. It's even uh, depicting this 1260 years. Because this flood really culminated a lot in about 538 AD. All of this flood of false worship and false doctrine. And during that period of time called the Dark Ages, there was many martyrs killed because they stood for the truth and they would not repent. And they lost their life. You can see a date there of uh, 538 A.D. You see another date of 1798. That's 1,260 years between them. 1798, we know that French, French General Berthier took captive the Pope and broke his uh, civil power over the church. Put him in prison, and he died there. Broke that power in 1798. The end of that 1,260-year period of time that is spoken of these different scriptures that we've read. 
But that wasn't the end. So we're going to go on and read. We're going to see some other things that take place. This is in Revelation 17, 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, I will show you Show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that setteth upon many waters. That's Satan's woman, the great whore that set upon many waters. Okay? With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Remember we read that before, right? And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Here's the other cup that those that follow the woman will is drinking of abominations and fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Bible in the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Tell us some particular things that, that are to take place. The beast that was, the beast that is not, and the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. All of the same beast. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So maybe they thought at the time when they broke the power and put him in prison, he died there, that this was the end of that beast. He says, no, there's a period of time that he was, he was not, and he yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And there are seven kings Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goes into perdition. And the ten horns which thou saw are ten, ten, uh, ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and their strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is sovereign of sovereigns and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, the waters which thou saw where the whore sets are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So it gives us an understanding of what waters also represent is people and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her in fire. For Elohim hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of Elohim shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. 
This is the period that we find ourselves in. We're seeing, going to see truly these kingdoms give their power unto the beast. There's another picture that uh, depicts these things. We see also the, these culminations of what was spoken in Daniel with those things that's spoken in Revelation. They obtain to the same thing, just different symbols that represents the same thing. You remember the dream Nebuchadnezzar had of the, the statue and how that each one of these represents a kingdom that, were, that ruled over the whole world. First you have Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar being the king there, his head of gold. And if you go through that whole story, it tells you who these people are. <clears throat> You've got Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then you got Rome. Look at the times that these are set in history. Of course, we know that Rome was in power during when our Messiah was here. Rome really became what it was right before, some 30 some odd years before the cross or more. But these beasts that he's talking about here are these beasts that's beyond the cross there. These beasts with these horns, and then it becomes crowns. Then we see that one of their heads is wounded. And what about this little guy on the end that is reaching back and getting a hold of this beast that has the iron teeth and so forth? So what we're going to do is look at Daniel right here and maybe get a better understanding of what's being portrayed here. Because as I said, both of these in Daniel and Revelation are the same thing. Daniel 7, 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed when he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. That's Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in its mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said those thus unto it arise and devour much flesh. Medo-Persia. Interesting, even today we see remnants of these old kingdoms because some of it has been melted into other kingdoms. I don't know if you realize it or not, but Iran is from the per Persian kingdom, still in existence today. Daniel 7, 6, going on, After this I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Grecia. After this I saw in the middle, in that vision, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Then I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. 
These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Have the saints possessed the kingdom yet? No. We're still in this war. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time, times, and dividing of times. Once again, we see the same wording as we saw in Revelation. This horn that spoke against the Most High. But the judgment shall set, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom of the whole earth, heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. May that come soon, because that's not happened yet. We hope to be seeing that happen in our lifetime. So once again, if you go to the next slide, I'll put the next slide back in. So you see, see these things that um, have taken place, some of the things that are, are taking place and some that will. I would invite you to maybe thinking about, talking about, Delving into more in depth of Daniel and Revelation on Wednesday evening. So if you'd like to come, we will look in more to the understandings of these, what these beasts represent, who they are. Uh, we find that these beasts are still alive. Because if you look there, it talked about the beast that was and was not. And then he was again. See that beast at the very top up there. He's the same beast as the other beast there, right? He disappeared for a while. But then he's going to come after at the end of the millennium. When uh, Satan is going to be brought out of his uh, dungeon again, uh, once again, the pit. And he's going to go forth to try to overcome God's people one last time. So <clears throat> you see, see these beasts and what if you find out exactly who they are and who they represent, there's the woman that sets upon the waters. Also, it shows that the beast sets upon, the woman sets upon the beast at some time. And interesting, that beast right there has no horns. This is a confederation of all of the mountains, basically, you might call put together and she's over all of them we even know that she boasts today that that uh, they have the power to change God's law it says if we didn't have it says the Protestant church would not continue to follow Sunday so but the next slide kind of shows you the end of that it's when it, uh, <clears throat> these beasts will be destroyed and uh, the beast, the false prophet. And the in interesting there at the very corner down there, you see 
right before the millennium, you see remnants of these uh, four kingdoms. And that is the judgment scene there, that great day of judgment. So, like I say, if you'd like to try to learn some more of this, I would invite you to come Wednesday nights. We're going to try to get a better understanding of what all this means because we've just barely gra scratched the surface. So, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so Shabbat Shalom to everyone. I hope you uh, maybe learned some things that you hadn't heard before. Uh, but uh, there's much, much more to be learned. Uh, we've mostly concentrated, you know, for the foundation of the Torah being the foundation of understanding. Once we grasp that, then we can begin to understand Daniel and Revelations and these types of things. But we, but we got to have that foundation to start with. For watching a teaching from Amet HaTorah. If you are ever in the Odessa area, we would love to welcome you to our Shabbat service, 11 a.m. every Sabbath. For more information or for more teachings, feel free to find us on the web, www.amethatoraodessa.com. Also, you can find us on Facebook. Thank you. God bless you and your family. Shalom.